Hi, I'm Mike Bellevue, and recently I was in Branson, Missouri, where I attended the 11th Annual Single Action Shooting Society Convention. And while I was there, I took the opportunity to run up to Springfield, Missouri, to the headquarters of the Bass Pro Shops chain of outdoor stores. And in this headquarters Bass Pro, they have a brand new satellite facility of the NRA's National Firearms Museum. And they've dedicated a lot of space to this. It's, it's free for anybody to enter. And it's a phenomenal museum. And I'm gonna show you a little bit of it today. And this is just gonna be a short, uh, a short excerpt of the things that I saw. And I'm gonna show you some of the things that I found the most interesting there. But I spent about three hours there uh, when I visited it. And it's, it's well worth the trip. So I hope you enjoy what I'm going to show you, and if you're in Springfield, Missouri, I hope you'll take the opportunity to drop by the Bass Pro headquarters and tour the NRA's National Firearms Museum exhibit uh, that's on display there. I want to start off by showing you some cap and ball revolvers. Now some of these are just good clean specimens of, of their models, and others are really unique. So we'll start off here with the Patterson. This, of course, was Colt's first successful revolver. Uh, he ended up going out of business with this. It just didn't sell. But uh, they've got a beautiful copy uh, here in the museum. Uh, next is the Walker. This was Colt's re-entry into the gun business, uh, and it was used during the Mexican War. Now, most of these didn't survive, so it's unusual to come up with one because, of course, they're quite old and the metallurgy wasn't so good, a lot of them exploded their cylinders. Which is why they came up with the Dragoon series. And this is a third model Dragoon. That's a beautiful gun. And this was incredibly successful for Colt. Uh, now here's a nice 51, uh, 1851 Navy in 36 caliber, which was standard for these guns. This was the first really successful belt pistol and a big favorite with Wild Bill Hickok and lots of old West gunmen. But here's something that is truly unique. This is a prototype that was made in 40 caliber. And this was as big a caliber as they could make in the standard size Navy cylinder. And they decided it wasn't big enough uh, to be viable. They were going for 44 caliber. And that's how they ended up with this next gun, uh, which is the 1860 Army. And this is kind of a neat specimen because it comes equipped with a shoulder stock that's hollow. It's a canteen. You can see the little screw cap. So you could fill that with water or generally they'd fill it with spirits. Uh, now we get so used to Colts and Remingtons that most people don't realize that there were a lot of real oddball revolvers that got used during the Civil War. Uh, just stuff that you wouldn't even think you could hold reasonably well, let alone shoot. And this uh, Navy gun by the Savage Arms Company is a great example of one of these oddball types, and there were a lot of them used during the Civil War. Now here's another neat Civil War gun. It's a double-action cap and ball revolver. This one's made by the Massachusetts Arms Company, and it's really a copy of a British gun, the, the Adams. Uh, it's a beautiful gun, and this is one of the guns I wish I could have pulled out of the exhibit to go shoot, because this is just such a, a cool-looking gun. Uh, I think it's very neat. And then we've got an actual Remington revolving rifle, which is just beautiful. This one's in 36 cap and ball, and you just don't see these very often at all. Next, we'll look at some cartridge firing guns of the Old West, and we'll start off by looking at Colts. And uh, a lot of the guns in the exhibit uh, that are Colts were actually owned by Texas Rangers. And this particular single action, which is a beautiful engraved copy, was owned by W.W. Sterling, who's the only man to rise from being a private in the Ranger Force to become the Adjutant General commanding the entire Ranger Force. And, and this is a beautiful gun. Now this is a rare plated and engraved sheriff's model and it actually belonged to a real live deputy sheriff. So I think that's kind of interesting. This is the model 1877. It was Colt's first double action revolver. 
And this one's in 41 caliber, which was known by the nickname of the Thunderer. The 38 calibers were known as Lightnings. Uh, these guns are beautiful, uh, but they were not very reliable. They had a lot of small, intricate parts, and they had an odd locking system through the rear of the cylinder. And as it turned out, the frame of the revolver was not really strong enough to support that locking system well, and that's why a lot of these things broke down. The Model 1878 that you see here was a better design, and it was a more successful double action for Colt. Uh, it was available in all the same calibers and barrel lengths as the single action army was. And we've got here a beautiful example of an 1878 in a sheriff's model. And you know, this gun really could be a good carry gun even today. Smith & Wesson was Colt's most successful competitor. And this uh, 44 caliber American model was Smith & Wesson's first big bore revolver. Now the Schofield model was adopted by the US Cavalry. And this one has a very rare safety device. It's activated by that huge lever on the right hand side of the gun. Now here's another Schofield that has had its barrel cut down to five and a half inches. And it was used by the Wells Fargo company to arm their guards. Uh, here's a beautiful Smith & Wesson new model number three. And a lot of people think that the new model number three was the best single action revolver ever built. Smith & Wesson got into the double action revolver game in about 1883. Now, I own one of these in 4440, and it's a great gun. Uh, these were excellent double action revolvers, even if they look a little bit different to us today. Remington was Colt's biggest competitor back in the cap and ball days, but it really lost its, uh, its step in the cartridge era and fell well behind Colt. Now, personally, I really like 1875 Remingtons like this one. Now, this particular model right here was one of the most interesting guns in the exhibit to me personally. This bird's head grip Remington never went into production, uh, but I really like it. And in fact, I'm trying to interest one of the big importers to see if they can convince Uberti to make this model for the cowboy action shooting market. Merwin Hulbert was another Colt competitor. And there are a lot of people who say that this Merwin Hulbert was the best engineered single action revolver of the 19th century. Now, this is a neat single action revolver that Hopkins and Allen's made for military trials in the 1870s. Uh, it was not accepted, but it looks like a pretty neat design. Now, British double action six guns were very popular in the American West, and this Webley Bulldog was the first one ever produced. Uh, likewise, this Wesley Richards Royal Irish Constabulary was also serial number one. This group of pistols were used in the U.S. Army's uh, handgun trials of 1907. This particular Luger was submitted in 30 caliber, as most of them were. But two later examples were submitted in 45 ACP, and they are among the most rare guns uh, in the entire world. The Savage Model 1907 that you see here was one of the two finalists in the 1907 trials. Uh, the other one was the 1907 Colt itself, which of course led to the 1911. This Grant Hammond Model 1917 was considered by the Army as a replacement for the Colt 1911, but it was ultimately rejected. But the U.S. Navy actually did adopt this Remington Patterson 45 ACP pistol over the 1911. But Remington decided not to put it into production. And I got to tell you, I love this gun. And if there was any gun that I was tempted to break the glass and grab and run, this was it. There's just something about this. Uh, I'm just dying to get my hands on one and shoot it. There's something about the way it looks that really speaks to me. Well, that's it. I hope you enjoyed this look at some selected firearms from the National Firearms Museum. Uh, and if you're ever in Springfield, Missouri, you really owe it to yourself to stop by Bass Pro and go through the exhibit.